afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager here at Barometer Capital. And today we have a very special uh, guest hosting. Diana Avidar, our head of trading, has just joined us this afternoon. Uh, and she would be pleased to address your questions after the call. But first, she's going to lead us into a great macro overview. And, uh, and so we look forward to hearing what Diana has to say. Diana, welcome to the program. We're thrilled to have you and look forward to hearing what you see every day as eyes and ears on our trading desk. Look forward to the conversation. I turn the conversation now over to you. Thank you very much, Pamela. Nice to see you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us and welcome to another session of Barometer Readings. My name is Diana Victor, and I am the head of trading at Barometer Capital. My role at Barometer is to manage all our trading across the whole platform and deliver intelligence in real time, boots on the ground, information and analysis to our investment team on trading flows, volumes, sentiment, and trends to help them in their process as they make fundamental decisions about the portfolios. I am here today instead of David Boros, who is out this week. Thank you for joining in. I want to start us with a little recap of what happened the past week and since the last time we met on the Barometer Readings platform. The S&P price action last week was choppy. The S&P ended pretty much flat, maybe a little bit down. But here is the one-year um, chart of the S&P. The choppiness does not even register in the longer-term chart. TSX for the week did better than the S&P. TSX over the same period, um, and this is not usual, TSX has been gaining in relative strength lately, um, and it's taken a bit of time to catch up, but it is now at a two-year high, and this is the one-year chart of the TSX. NASDAQ on the week underperformed the rest of the markets, as it was mainly technology stocks that were hurt the most last week, and you may have heard all over the news, NVIDIA, 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 and we will go through that and we'll go through some stock charts uh, later on in the presentation. And I'll take any questions that you might have on that. Um, this is so this is NASDAQ for the week. Uh, but in the big picture, in the long term picture, NASDAQ being the best performing uh, index or market um, actually in the world, actually, but definitely in North America, um, it does not really register a blip because it has done so, so well. Uh, this is oil, and um, oil has been stuck in uh, this kind of trading range, um, around $77, $78. Um, it was a little volatile last week, uh, but it ended flat on the week, and it's um, it's around the same level uh, today as well. It's interesting how oil is not moving uh, a lot higher, despite the fact that we have two major conflicts globally. Um, we have we have geopolitical. Uh, events that we hear about in um, in the Red Sea, and you know, and 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 it's just not moving. It's just testament to the fact that there is um, enough supply, and the bears will tell you um, that um, the economy is is perhaps not growing. Uh, we'll go through some of those uh, ideas as well. The interesting thing um, is this is the XLF, um, the XLE. This is the Energy Select Sector ETF for the week. Um, the oil stocks have actually been doing much better than the underlying commodity. And, you know, this is this is one of the things that we look for uh, when we look at relative strength winners. When we look to analyze the market, we look at what stands out, what sort of may not make sense. Why is the commodity flat, but the stocks are acting better? Um, so we see that as an outlier and, um, and, and, and breadth has been expanding in this sector. Um, and the stocks outperformed. The dollar index over the week uh, ended lower um, relative to other currencies as the Canadian dollar um, held back due to Bank of Canada not cutting rates just yet. We would all want Bank of Canada to start cutting rates, or maybe not. We'll go through why uh, rate cuts versus uh, rate hikes or, or stability of rates, um, wh which one the market seems to prefer. This is the Canadian dollar, and this is what I meant uh, over the week. Strengthen as Bank of Canada met and did not give us an interest rate cut. 
in the Canadian economic numbers and employment numbers, um, as we'll see uh, in the next few slides, have actually been okay. So we had CPI numbers on, uh, actually we had this today. I just, uh, I just entered this chart this morning. Um, they were just a tad higher than expected. Initially, the market moved lower, but given where the level is and how much it has come down, you look at uh, this inflation number at 8% at the peak there, and we're now at about 3.5%. Um, this little bit extra was interpreted by the market as a good thing, as it still keeps the Fed on the rate cutting path, but takes out the disinflation narrative. We want Goldilocks. We don't want inflation, but we also don't want disinflation. You need to remember this is a two-edged sword. We want inflation to come down, but we don't want it to mean low growth or bad economy or bad for earnings. This is the sector moves that we've seen last week. As you can see in the table, old winners were down and the sectors that move up were the reflationary cyclical sectors, as well as defensives, energy, utilities, materials, think gold, um, and real estate with financials up as well. For Canada, materials were up, uh, were the best sector, they were up uh, 5% over here but that caught up for the year-to-date number it's still uh, it's still down about one and a half percent um materials is a much more important sector for the tsx than for the s p financials another important sector for the tsx were up a healthy one percent and for the year they are now up three and a half percent clawing back from being in the red for much of the year industrials uh, i guess they're the magnificence of canada um, up 9.6% for the year, whereas in the U.S., the MAG7 and the rest of technology have it as the best sector on the year, um, up uh, over 1%. Information technology up 11.27% um, on the year, but it has given back a little bit last week. Portfolios, depending on whether they are income or equities, have three major sectors at the top. Financials, information technology, and industrials in a pretty diversified way. On industrials, think election year, think infrastructure spending bill, think tax cuts in the US, the sector that benefits from all the fiscal spending that is going on both here and in the US um, relative to our benchmarks would be considered underweight technology and overweight financials. It is always important to look at what the fixed income markets are telling us as well. So the top part here is investment grade spreads over treasuries, and the bottom one is high yield spreads over treasuries, both charts benign. We watch these for indications of liquidity stress in the debt market. If there were cash flow issues, it would show up here first. So as you can see, markets may have had a flat and choppy week, but not so bad at all and not unexpected given the year to date rally. Now we've had a really great run so far. I would be remiss if I didn't say that we are due for a pause. But given some fundamental data sets that I will show you in the next few slides, the market had some pretty good reasons to be acting this way. As always, there is a debate going on. There's always a debate going on in the market, and especially since rates moved off the zero level. I decided to list only four points on each slide, uh, of, of side of the bull and the bear side, but I could have had done uh, more. There's lots of little items that the market is climbing whilst a worry on. Um, they also point out that the economic data on balance is very good. The bulls are pointing to earnings growth. Um, and I will show you what the earnings growth proje uh, progression has been in the next few slides. Rates are just right, they say, meaning that when rates were at zero, a project at any cost made sense, given money was free. So it wasn't always a great project. And so there were a lot of projects that should not have been undertaken. A normalized rate environment sifts through the good and the bad um, and makes companies more effective and productive. And finally, immigration is a two-edged sword. It is a tax on our dollars initially, but it also provides growth over the long term. Bears will argue valuation, but a good market has never been very, very cheap. Cheap you get when we're in a crisis or have recently been in the crisis. In addition, the aggregate valuation in the market is skewed up by the Magnificent Seven, which undoubtedly are more expensive, but also exhibit much higher growth profiles. 
<coughs> they will point to the fact that we could have a recession. And that may be true. We might have one one day, but it doesn't look imminent right now. They will point to high national debt and personal debt, which is true, but growth is the best may, way to manage debt. So there's always a debate to be made. Pearl markets seem simple, but they are not um, easy, as Buffett said in his last meeting. It is not easy, as there is a plethora of information to integrate, and forecasting is a sport that neither Bay Street nor Wall Street have been able to master. And so, as you know, the barometer strategy is not to predict, but rather read what the market is telling us now and invest according to what is happening now, not what we think should happen. <clears throat> the big debate is recession or no recession. Four or five percent rates seems like it's the end of the world to some. Some are saying that we'll have a forever inflation with forever high rates, and there is a real list of things that the market is climbing will also worry on. In reality, this level of rates is not historically restrictive. And while everyone is talking about the fact that the market is acting this way because we're done raising, I'm not sure that's all there is to it. And I am also not convinced that the market will be in dire shape should central banks not cut as much or as fast as previously thought. As a matter of fact, we started out the year pricing in 150 beeps of rate cuts, and now the market is pricing in only 80 beeps. The slack has been picked up by growth. Market was pricing in the first cut in March, and now it moved it out to June. Market held in pretty well throughout this repricing, and that is in most part for the reasons that the economy is doing okay, unemployment is low, and earnings are supportive. Like Buffett said, investing is like dieting, <clears throat> simple, but not easy. And it's not easy because there's a lot of noise out there. Now that we took the temperature of the market, let me show you the chart I think is the most telling of all. This chart shows us the earnings progression of the S&P 500. It is clear to me looking at this that the market is following the earnings progression estimates. It is a market of stocks, after all. Sometimes we are mobilized more by macro, but at the end of the day, it is the earnings capabilities of the stocks in the market that will ultimately drive direction. And as the market is a forward-looking uh, pricing mechanism, it started its 2023 rally right at the point where earnings were at the lowest and started to point higher. And if you look out to the end of 24, we are expecting earnings to continue to recover. So does that mean it's now over, given that the market is a forward pricing, um, forward looking pricing mechanism? I do not think so. Not as long as the earnings marginal change is positive. We have also seen a market that has actually been broadening and incorporating other sectors that were less strong thus far, such as energy and industrials, and financials participating in a pretty nice way. Until now, people paid up for growth where it was scarce elsewhere. So they bought the tech world and segments of healthcare. Now growth can be found elsewhere as well, and the market can start broadening to incorporate other sectors. Take a look at this chart. It's cumulative US net trading flows. This is the kind of stuff that we see in a granular way on trading desks. This is just kind of put together um, for us in a neat way. Um, this is what trading flows have been, the selling of materials, energy, and healthcare. And yet we see the price action being positive. So what that tells us is that these sectors are now coming alive. Breadth is expanding. And as you saw earlier, I showed you the chart of the oil flat. You have the ETF incorporating names like Exxon and Chevron is actually um, trading up. So what this tells us is that positioning is very low and there is lots of room for these sectors to play catch up. In addition, other markets have started to also perform in what seems like a global economic growth revival, despite all the worries about geopolitical events. This is Japan. Japan had had three lost decades. What is it doing acting like this? Well, they're also experiencing some inflation. For them, that's a good thing because they've been deflationary for so long. And next week, Bank of Japan meets and the market is saying maybe, just maybe they're gonna come off the zero rate environment and start raising rates. In this case, 
Raising rates means that the economy is doing well and they can start normalizing. Zero rates is not normal. Global recession expectations have also gone down dramatically, with two-thirds of investors expecting a soft landing. But more importantly, there is a fifth of investors that expect now a no landing, used to be at zero. So we've gone a long way from fearing a recession, though you wouldn't know it by listening to the TV. Likewise, sentiment is much better. And the chart says most bullish since January 22. This is Bank of America Global Fund Manager Survey. Um, so recession expectations have gone down dramatically um, and sentiment is much better, but not euphoric, thanks to the bull bear debate that I mentioned earlier. This is good because it means not everyone is talking their book and it means there is room to move forward. Maybe we pause to rest for a bit as I mentioned earlier, it would be prudent, but it will be key to see what changes during that rest. And if nothing, then dips will be bought. The key to this post-COVID recovery is people working, employment. This is what holds up sentiment. When you're working, you're happy, able to provide for yourself and your family, and you can buy, feeding into those earnings estimates I mentioned earlier. This is the second most important data point you should watch to earnings unemployment. Unemployment data was released last Friday. Unemployment rate went up slightly in the U.S. to 3.9 versus expectations of 3.7. 3.9 is still a very low level, and you can see in the chart that it barely registers. The fact that it is higher uh, than was expected supports the view that the Fed will cut rates. In testifying to the Senate Banking Committee, Powell noted last week that the Fed needs quote, just a bit more evidence before rate cuts. And another quote, we're not far from it, he said. Likewise, in Canada, unemployment numbers were released on Friday, and they were in line with expectations at 5.8%. Canadian unemployment is structurally higher than the U.S. Obviously, low unemployment is, low, is key, but wages is important as well. And wages um, have been um, have have gotten elevated, but they're moderating now. So this is also supportive of the Fed's ability to cut rates and Bank of Canada, frankly, as well. Even though they didn't go this time, they also need to see a little bit more de uh, data. There is a debate going on in the wage line. This is the wage picture in the U.S. Wages are elevated but trending down. Higher wages could mean more inflation and for longer. But higher wages also mean more consumption, which means growth, which means earnings. And we're back to the first important data point, earnings. We need those to fuel uh, the market of stocks. So far, so good. It's a natural transition for me to show you the consumer's shopping strength of the past holiday season as we speak of wages. The consumer had a really good showing over the holiday period, beat all expectations. So with the economy doing okay, the consumer doing okay, let's for a second go back to earnings. This is the original chart that I showed you for the full S&P 500, just as a jumping board for the next one. This is EPS growth in tech. So what you can see is a massive recovery and now moderation, but still very, very strong. The numbers, growth numbers, EPS growth numbers are incredible. They're very, very good. This will tell you um, why NASDAQ outperformed until now. Let's take out tech. This trade has played out very well so far. What else is there to do? This is EPS growth, S&P 500, X technology. We can see that while it took the market a whole bit longer, the rest of the market is picking up now on the earnings per share growth side. And this is what we are seeing in the market as well. This earnings power is starting to be reflected. The market is broadening. And as I mentioned earlier, other sectors are participating as well. So there's other things to do. Our portfolios reflect this as we morph with the market. Our portfolio management team in their daily work naturally ebb and flow with this as names come into their radars and trickle into their relative strength work, 
prompting the important work of fundamental analysis and earnings power analytics. So as tech halted its nosebleed rally last week, it actually uh, recovered today, but it rested for a bit last week. We have added to energy, financials, and materials, as I will show you later when we get to the portfolio section. Our turnover in the portfolio has been pretty low, as our top holdings are of really premier quality. Think NVIDIA, Fairfax, Lilly, JP Morgan, CNQ and CIBC, Visa, Imperial Oil. Those are all premier names and pretty diversified. But underneath the surface, we found other names, smaller industrials, um, that we are able to pepper the portfolio um, with, with other, um, other situations as they become available. And as the market broadens, so do our holdings. As always, we work, to, uh, we work the portfolios in proper risk-adjusted return mode. That means being in the sectors that are working. Okay, back to earnings. Earnings uh, revisions are running above historical trend for both Q1 and full year 2024. So I have shown you some of the reasons why the market currently looks like there are some decent opportunities and why we are currently fully invested in our portfolios. So what's happening on the trading desks? We don't make predictions, mind you. That's a silly game that Wall Street and Bay Street play. Nobody wins. Already the market is above all estimates, and we're only in March. Analysts are just starting to raise their targets. Um, on the rate, this is a chart on the rate path. No one agrees. Not, not one strategist agrees what the rate path is going to be. Remember, forecasts are not facts. They are only possibilities. They're not even probabilities. Before I get into the granular, I would be remiss if I don't mention one thing. We have to remember this is an election year in the U.S. It is highly unlikely that there will be anything to deflect the status quo. As a matter of fact, one of the things that market bears point to as the main reason the market stayed so long, um, so strong, is that um, the liquidity that central bankers took out of the system that by by raising rates is being offset by a huge amount of fiscal liquidity that has been delivered into the system. Think about the infrastructure bill, read spending, and now there is another potential tailwind, tax cuts. Nancy Lazar at Piper Sandler, you may have heard of her, she's an excellent economist with a 30-year career, points this next chart out and gives us that the total programs and tax cuts expected in 2024 may delay her bearish tilt. But election year will probably hold any kind of economic shocks back, fiscal or monetary. And this is why the market is probably broadening. We can probably relax and focus on the micro as the macro is probably going to be very subdued. And by the way, micro, Goldman notes that correlations have been very low in the market and consistent with low correlations, S&P 500 stock returns have recently been driven by micro rather than macro factors. Fiscal policy is one of the most stimulative of the past 15 years. So if you believe that monetary policy tightening is done for now, which I do, and you think fiscal stimulus is not being taken away right now because it is an election year and you just don't want to upset the voters, then this leads to a pretty good trading environment. Stability and lack of surprises is key. So what do we see on trading? We see people are generally invested with bonds coming out of their longest bull market with rates likely never going significantly down to the level they were before, and certainly not for as long as they were before. The bond market is not a screaming buy relative to stocks. So portfolios are generally fully invested as are ours. What do we see as the most popular exposures? Bank of America Merrill Lynch surveyed the market for what is the most crowded trade and being long, Magnificent Seven, of course, came out on the top. Everybody's invested. And no surprise, as the world doesn't change that fast. But our job to, is to see the differentials and our work is showing that as the market is broadening, we are starting to see that there may be something to do elsewhere as well. Short China came in a far second. 
And long Japan is only at 4%. And I've shown you Japan chart. So I think that number is going to go up. Our portfolios over the past month, we have increased our financials weight slightly by about 1.5%, just reflecting the better action in the sector. Everyone should love the safe dividends you're getting while waiting. And also, as the stocks are doing better, we are a little relative, uh, we are a little overweight there uh, relative to the index. Information technology is down over the course of the month by about 16% to a bit over 15% weight in total, but really underweight the index because the index is so heavy technology. Um, the index is at 28% and we're at 15. We sold Adobe and Google, still have NVIDIA and Microsoft and Meta. Over to industrials, which have been doing very well. Our weight there is slowly increasing, and it is a sector we are overweight relative to the index at 13% versus the index, which is around eight and a half. Some of the names here are very attractive. Names like Stantec, which is a North American engineering consultant with half of their business exposed to the US, which, which, uh, which will allow them to uh, greatly benefit from the theme of onshoring, as well as the benefit from the US infrastructure stimulus, um, or Eaton, a $100 billion uh, market cap company with, who, who is a double digit um, top line grower. Their earnings outpaces at about 20%. Eaton is a true diversified industrial company. They really do it all. In healthcare, we have been a long term holder of Lilly, and it has done very well for us. The story here is not yet over. And of course, we will always be mindful of the price action, regardless of our view. Um, but the company's price pattern is fine. I want to end with showing you the price action of some of our top names and some that we added. And then I will open up to any questions that you might have. I mentioned Lee's price pattern. It is looking just fine. This is how big the obesity and Alzheimer market is, among others in their pipeline. You've heard of Ozempic and Monjaro. It's a big trend uh, and one that can double and triple revenues over the next five years. Everyone wants to see NVIDIA. This is NVIDIA. This one has done very well for us. Our cost base is very low. It has its first real bad day on Friday. It was down 5% on the day, but that's after it was up 5%. So um, a lot of the headlines are telling you that it was an outside reversal. Today it was up 5%, so we've come back uh, some. Um, our cost trace base was really low. Um, we have taken profit on this position um, at least twice over the last few months. Portfolios that have gone to 7 8% weights, we've taken them, them back to 4% twice. But we've taken some profits al along the way. Um, the stock was trading at 94 RSI. Just uh, by way of context, 70 RSI is considered to be uh, high. 94 RSI is very high. Um, and tech flows have turned slightly negative. So we will be watching for sure. And I've shown you the most crowded trade. So a lot of people are invested in this. Um, and of course, that doesn't really matter what the cost is, cost base is, but the growth this company produced in the last quarter is over 200%. And uh, they guide it to over 200%. So it's not something that can be ignored if it breaks. We'll take care of it, but it's been a huge winner. And so far, it's still looking okay, as you can see. Next on is, I wanted to show you, is an industrial. It's This is Eaton Corp. It's a pure and truly diversified industrial company making everything from aerospace components to golf club grips. And here is Stantec in Canada. Um, this is the one I mentioned before, North American engineering consultant with half of their business exposed to the US. Um, so this will greatly allow them to uh, benefit from the theme of onshoring. A couple of new ones that we bought, um, as gold has, um, has, has put in a, a really decent rally in the last little while, is Agnico Eagle, as gold has been acting okay of late. And I didn't mention gold or show a chart of gold, but we Canadians love it when gold works because it's a decent uh, percentage of our index, and it's been working now. Um, it's a small volatile, uh, it's a small and volatile sector, 
but sometimes when it gets going, it can have a lot of torque. Um, the reason we chose Agnico is because it's Canadian and large cap. There are smaller cap gold companies that gold producers that could have more torque, but a sector with torque and stocks with torque, you might as well go all in on Bitcoin, which Global Macro also has some exposure to Bitcoin. But with operations in questionable geographies, we prefer our nice and peaceful Canada, and that's what Agnico Eagle is. And then finally, Citigroup. Um, we've added to Citigroup in the last few weeks. Um, they trade at 60% of book, and they were a perennial underachiever. But they look like they're getting their ducks in line now. Uh, the new CEO is putting his stamp on the company. Um, the company has been always cheap because of the many different mismanaged lines of business. Uh, so once it is starting to get cleaned up, there's a lot of inefficiencies that it can squeeze uh, profits from. Uh, JP Morgan, by way of contrast, is at 1.7 times book. Uh, this is at 60% book. Bank of Nova Scotia is at 1.2 times book. Um, and City also has a 3.5% dividend. So, um, so we're happy with that. So I hope that this has given you a glimpse into what we've been doing in the portfolios. Uh, thank you for listening. And if there's any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thanks so much, Diana. Always a pleasure to have you joining us. Uh, and I know I know our investors really appreciate it. Thank Speaking of much. which, we have a question from Alejandro. Alejandro asks, Diana, the U.S. Treasury curve has been inverted for almost two years. And the inversion of the three month versus the 10 year, 100% of the cycles has ended in a recession. It seems the market is pricing and no landing, as you said. What do you think about what the U.S. Treasury curve has been telling us for quite a while? Love to get your thoughts on that, Diana. Uh, definitely. This is this this could have been on my bull bear debate on the bear side. Um Pamela, two years is a long time to have an inverted yield curve, Alejandro. Um, it will either resolve or we will go into a recession. Um, all I know, and people talk about this a lot, um, you know, the the um, the speed with which central banks raised rates that is that is unprecedented. Um, we'll see what happens with the rate cuts, and that may normalize the curve, and we may not have a recession. I hate to say this; I always shudder um, when when I'm thinking to myself that maybe it's different this time. But I'm just going to go out and say it: we don't have a pandemic every time we've had a recession. Um, this has been a different situation. The inflationary pressures that we've seen coming out of COVID, the CPI jumping all of a sudden to 8% while everybody was saying transitory, transitory. Um, nobody expected it, and, this, and therefore the speed with which central bankers had to raise rates um, been unprecedented. I think that feeds into the yield curve uh, problem that is going on and that has not normalized yet. So we'll see what happens now. Economic data has normalized. Inflation has come back in quite substantially. Um, and I think it normalizes. Thanks so much, Diana. The next question comes from Stephen in Toronto's Better Half, Jill. And this question is on our newly launched Global Equity Fund. Diana, can you speak to the fund's performance and uh, maybe speak to rel the Fund's performance relative to the benchmark. Yeah. Okay. That that's a great um, that's a great uh, in, intro, Pamela. Um, the fund is designed to closely mirror its um, benchmark, which is the MSCI XUS. In the portfolio, it is not meant to take any um, outsized exposures that are not um, close to the MSCI index X US. It is designed to be similar in um, direction and volatility with a risk-adjusted return 
that will mimic that of the MSCI plus something. So the performance has so far done what it's supposed to be doing. Off the top of my head, it's up about 5.5% year to date. And, and the MSCI XUS is up about uh, 4% year to date. So it's outperforming its index by 1.5%. Now, could you deliver more return by taking more risk and not be as diversified? The portfolio will always hold about 60 names, which is often, that that's often higher than the rest of our portfolios, which are more targeted with smaller amounts of weight um, uh, names and bigger weights in bigger sector calls. This one will not make um, such a big sector call and it will be always fairly diversified. So you will get a, a lockstep return little by little and uh, you, you know, the portfolio should exhibit very little volatility and risk. That's great. Thanks so much, Diana, for the overview. I know that uh, it's it's an opportunity and we're strongly encouraging our current clients to hold a 5% position in their portfolios. If you want any further information on the Global Equity Fund, David Burroughs and our team would be pleased to speak to you about that offline. And with that, Diana, we've uh, come to the tail end of our conversation. It's been a real pleasure having you on our Barometer Readings update. So thank you so much for your time. I know that uh, everyone appreciates your your eyes, ears, and uh, vision uh, in terms of what you are seeing and hearing uh, as the, the tape tickers along. So thanks so much for, for joining us again. And with that, if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to reach out. We're available by phone or email and uh, look forward to seeing everyone back same time, same place next Tuesday at 4 p.m. with uh, David Burroughs back in the seat. Look forward to seeing you then and have a great evening. Thanks, Diana. Thanks, Pamela. Thank you, everyone.